Mayor Harry Scott, welcome to our radio talk. It's a pleasure to be here, John. And we appreciate all that you and CKPC are doing for Waterford and the surrounding area. Never did we think that we'd be broadcasting a live radio show from our little town. The Photo Life Project is, was a great idea. It was a great concept. <laughs> I didn't think we were going to do it. I didn't think we were going to pull it off. Uh, the Photo Life Project uh, is taking uh, three separate pictures from the archives here and then having those pictures come to life. Kind of looks like the berries my mother uses in her preserves, doesn't it, Uncle Clarence? Yeah, I guess it does, Russell. I'm hoping it brings us something more valuable than a red ribbon at the fair. The ginseng scene was a complete, complete nightmare. I would say that the biggest challenge was not having ginseng plants. <laughs> You know, everybody was racing around trying to figure out. Some were made by hand out of fake plants. We had to find buildings that existed or buildings that could match that or environments that could match that. But as it turns out, that was, that was quite challenging as it was. As far as building the tower, it was pretty much exactly as I thought it would go building it. But once we got it on set, onto the middle of a windy hill, things changed then. Now don't you boys climb another inch. We've got a train to catch to Brantford, and I haven't scheduled any time for a hospital visit. Uh, cars going by, there were uh, motorcycles, there were planes, there were um, shotguns, and there were no deaths. And I knew that for us on the production side, I, I knew we'd be able to deliver, but we're still just a small part of a very large team. And the rest of the team being volunteers, you know, it was, it was a worry. Can, can we pull this off? Waterford is a small town, about 2,800 people. It's at the north end of Norfolk County. It has a really rich agricultural history. Um, at one time was a real commercial and industrial hub, um, not so much anymore. Well, one thing that I really like uh, about living in Waterford is that there's this underground kind of scene of the arts and whatnot, and it's very interesting to get into all that stuff. Everybody's very passionate about it. Theatre seems to be um, a real interest for folks in Waterford and the surrounding area. When you go back in history, you can see that the Waterford Town Hall was used. There was opera houses there, there was vaudeville, all kinds of things going on. We have used um, the performance arts in past projects here at the museum. Personally, I feel it's a really great way to bring a story to life. It's an entertaining way. It makes history less boring, which is, you know, sometimes the assumption. Uh, the Photo Life Project uh, is taking uh, three separate pictures from the archives here and then having those pictures uh, come to life, basically. It would be the picture and then that would be replaced by live actors and on a on a set and then it would tell the story of what those pictures um, involved. Well, Melissa approached me with this idea. Uh, she saw a, an exhibit, I guess, uh, online from one of the museums in the States uh, where a photo came to life. When I consulted Dean at Rainy Media, his response to the idea was, oh yeah, we can do that and we can do it much, much better, which was exactly what I wanted to hear. So we put together a production team. We set the timelines and we had to, of course, choose those photos that we were going to use. Uh, and what we were looking for in the pictures was a scene in the pictures with enough characters and enough going on that photo that we could write a story around that photo so that we could make three short films, one per photo. We chose photos that were um, told a uniquely uh, Waterford story or Towns and Township story but that we thought would have broad appeal. But it also couldn't be too complicated. We had to we had to find buildings that existed or buildings that could match that or environments that could match that. It turns out that was, that was quite challenging as it was. The ginseng film uh, depicts Clarence Hellyer finding wild ginseng uh, root and realizing that it was something that he could harvest and sell. So it's really about the beginning of the ginseng in industry in Ontario. It happened right here. The ginseng set uh, was, it was one of the trickier ones because ginseng was originally grown in apple orchards and we quickly found out that the apple trees in this picture weren't grown like that anymore. So how we found the ginseng garden set 
or location was I, I was on another shoot and we were driving just driving along Front Road in St. Williams and we turned this corner and I looked on the right and all these trees were planted in rows. My cameraman who was going to be shooting the photo life project with me was with me at the time and we matched up the pictures and we said yeah. He said I think this will work. We built most of it the night before but we still couldn't we couldn't dress it uh, because as it turns out ginseng was being harvested then so we couldn't get any actual ginseng plants. I didn't think we were going to do it. I didn't think we were going to pull it off. It was down to the night before we were shooting. Holly and I were running around driving from garden center to garden center with a picture saying, have you got anything that looks like this? And luckily, uh, one of the places they said, oh, I've got something that looks just like that. And she showed us the plant. We're like, okay, we think this will work. So we laid them all out, kind of, you know, put boards around them so it didn't look like they were in potted plants because uh, I think some of them were on loan and uh, I think that caused some stress but you know what you know Murphy's Law is rampant in filmmaking like what can go wrong will go wrong and you just have to overcome it. We had a horticulturalist at the opening and he said where did you get the ginseng at that time of year and I said that wasn't ginseng and he had no idea. Kinda looks like the berries my mother uses in her preserves, doesn't it, Uncle Clarence? Yeah, I guess it does, Russell. I'm hoping it brings us something more valuable than a red ribbon at the fair. This berry's special. It's from the wild ginseng plants growing in the hardwood bush over on the tent. But don't go telling anyone that secret location, promise? Cross my heart and hope to die. Spit on the ground. Whoa, <sighs> never mind spitting. Just don't go telling. I won't. I can keep a secret. I never told anyone that I saw old Mr. John Brown court and Miss Sampson, now did I? No, sir, I did not. But why is it such a secret, this wild ginseng? Because Queen Victoria herself has declared this an endangered species. So we can grow new, sell that, but protect the old. That's good thinking. Well, I guess that's why she's the queen. These berries are going to grow us some valuable root. We're going to dig it, wash it, dry it and barrel it up. I've tasted the root and it tastes stronger than turnip. Who's going to pay a good dollar for something tasting like dirt? The Bell Butler Company in New York City. That's who. New York City? Are you telling me something you grow right here in your orchard in Norfolk County is going to end up in New York City? Yep. They put it on a train in Waterford and it travels into New York Central Station. And that's not its final stop. From there, they put it on a ship and send it off to China. How do I know you're telling the truth, Uncle Clarence? Remember when your aunt and I went to visit her cousins in Michigan? Yeah. Well, I saw this ad in the magazine for a fur broker in New York City. It says he's looking to buy ginseng root, begging for it, in fact. See, right here, Bell Butler, CEO. That's short for company. New York buyers and exporters of ginseng for over 30 years. Cash, paid by the pound. I thought to myself, I know what that is, and better yet, I know where to find it. Under the hardwood over on the 10th concession. Yep, but that's wild ginseng, so we can't dig it up. I just took a little seed. And planted it here in your apple orchard, which is just like under the hardwoods. Exactly. Ginseng needs leaf cover to protect it from the hot sun, and the leaves to fall off as mulch cover during winter. That's brilliant, Uncle Clarence. You're going to harvest two crops at the same time every year, apples and ginseng. Well, not exactly, Russell. We won't be digging this ginseng for almost seven years. Seven years? Yep. The longer the root lays in the ground, more money those New York buyers will pay us for it. They say the Chinese like the root. Short, fat, and old. Kind of like my teacher. What do you think those Chinamen are going to do with the root, Uncle Clarence? They use it for medicine. They say it purifies the blood and can cure asthma and the stomach ache. That's some medicine. Some even say it can make a man, well, more energetic. Energetic? Energetic in the sense that if old John Brown was to ever snag Miss Sampson, well, he could use a little ginseng himself. 
Well, let's finish picking these berries before your aunt calls us in for supper. Funny enough, I think it's the arena film that has really twigged the most with people because they remember it, it's nostalgia. The story is, is interesting and I find it particularly interesting to myself because I happen to be there at that event at that time. It involves the fundraising for the arena in Waterford, the Tricent Arena. It was going to cost $150,000, which was big money in those days. And one of the fundraising initiatives was a 30-hour radiothon that was going to be held at the local W.F. Hewitt School. And uh, CKPC was going to broadcast for them, and it was a big deal. I got involved in the Photo Life Project in a very interesting way. One of Dean's uh, good friends is my nephew. And uh, he phoned me one day and he said, my buddy Dean is doing this interesting project in Waterford and uh, one of the uh, scenes involves your father and they need someone to play your father. So I said, what's the question? I know exactly the guy. <laughs> so when I had Dan come in to audition, I, I didn't give him a lot of instruction. I just said, well, you've been there. Here's the script. Here's what we're doing. Uh, it's your dad. So, you know, have at it. And then I looked back at uh, my mom, who was one of the writers and producers on this, and Melissa, and they were just like beside themselves. They they said, "This is this is Harry Scott right here. That's that's it." And um, that kind of put like a real world feel to it. And then I got the chance to learn some things, like you know, Susan Church didn't actually get the rewards that she was given, and yeah, like all the I actually learned stuff out of this. I'm most proud of the fact that I wrote it and I feel good every time I watch it and um, that there was that, that uh, connection between Dan and his father that was really special. Uh, my dad was a larger than life character. Uh, he was the mayor of Waterford, he was the mayor of the city of Natticoke and whatnot. So it was an honor to, to be asked to, to do that and uh, I, I thank everybody involved for that. That was the Beach Boys with their number one hit, Good Vibrations. This is John Edgar of CKPC AM 1380, broadcasting live from W.F. Hewitt Public School in Waterford. The time is 1 p.m., and it's a cold one out there, folks. So you're going to want to get wrapped in your woolies and settle in by the radio, because we're in the middle of our 30-hour radiothon. You heard right. That's 30 consecutive hours of radio broadcasting right here in Waterford, Ontario. Now you're probably wondering why we're hosting a radiothon from Waterford. Well, we're privileged to have the mayor of this great town here with us to answer that question. Mayor Harry Scott, welcome to our radiothon. It's a pleasure to be here, John. And we appreciate all that you and CKPC are doing for Waterford and the surrounding area. Never did we think that we'd be broadcasting a live radio show from our little town. Now you guys may be little, but you're going to be celebrating Canada's centennial year in a big, big way. Why don't you tell the listeners at home what Waterford has planned to mark the 100th birthday of our great nation? Well, John, we're building a new arena, the first of its kind for our close-knit community. It'll be a place where the youth of our area can skate and play hockey during the winter, and a place we can hold events during the summer. Wow, sounds fantastic. But tell me, what does something like a new arena cost to build? Well, John, for a brand new state-of-the-art arena, we're looking at a cost of $150,000. Wow, and so I guess that's why we're here. That's right. We need your help, we need your listeners' help, we need the help of everybody in and around the community. <laughs> well, it certainly is a great project. And they need your help, folks. They're asking you to call in with your pledges. No amount is too small, and every donation will help them reach their goal. We've got a wonderful and beautiful group of ladies here accepting your pledges, whether you call in or drop by, as many people are doing. People have been popping in and out all morning, haven't they? Oh, yeah, we've got a lovely response from people. And we've even got a special guest here with us. And let's not keep this young lady waiting any longer. Would you do the honors of introducing her to our listening audience? I'd be glad to. I'm very pleased to introduce one of Waterford's own, Miss Susan Church. Good afternoon, Susan. Good afternoon, Mayor Scott. 
Now, you're not nervous, are you? Well, maybe a little bit. I've never been on the radio before. I hope I look okay. <laughs> you're doing just fine. Now, let me tell the listeners a little bit about why you're with us this afternoon. Recently, the Centennial Committee, who's overseeing the building of our new arena, held a contest that allowed the community the opportunity to submit a name for our new arena. Miss Church, you entered the contest and you won. Congratulations, Susan, you must be very proud. I am, thank you. Can you tell us the name you submitted? Tri Centurina. Wow, that's a mouthful. How did you come up with that name? Well, the Tri represents the three communities working together to build the arena. Waterford, Townsend Township, and Wyndham Township. And the Centurina is a combination of the words century and arena. That's brilliant. Thank you. I did wonder after I submitted it that I should have called it Tri Centurina, that maybe I made it too complicated. But I thought it was important to get the word century in there. After all, it is Canada Centennial we're celebrating. Well, I think you got it just right. And obviously the members of the committee thought just as you did. Your parents must be awfully proud of you. As a matter of fact, I know they are. I was talking to your dad just this morning when I picked up my mail. For those of you who don't know it, uh, Susan's father, Bill Church, is our local postmaster. Now, Susan, uh, was there a prize for coming up with the winning name? Yes, Mr. Edgar. Uh, call me John. Yes, Mr. John. I want a lifetime pass to get him free to all events held at the arena. Wow, that's terrific. I want to thank Miss Susan Church and Mayor Scott for being here with us this afternoon. The phones have been ringing off the hook, and the ladies have been kept very busy taking your pledges. Mayor Scott, would you do the honors of announcing some of the pledges we received? My pleasure. The Waterford Badminton Club has pledged $50. Miss Ada B. Massacre, $25. John Pasnick, $100. Thank you so much. Keep the community spirit going and keep those pledges coming and your radio tuned to AM 1380. This is our final push for fundraising and we need your help. Any final words, Mayor Scott? Folks, we appreciate any little bit you can give. And we want to give you assurances that your money will be well spent. The block work for the arena will be finished this week, and then the freezing equipment will be going in. In very short order, you're going to have one of the finest arenas anywhere. And the only one in the world named Tricenturina, thanks to Miss Susan Church. And a hearty thank you to CKPC and all their gang. Well, there you have it. Keep those phones ringing. We'll be here taking your pleasure. It's a great project for a great community. Now, here are the monkeys. Well, the geodetic tower um, was erected in the early 1900s and it was just at the north end of town. And at the top of that tower was the highest point in Norfolk County. And it was done as a project by the federal government to, to map and survey the Dominion of Canada. And tourists were coming to climb the tower and get that bird's eye view. As we had asked around, not many people knew that there ever was a tower here. Uh, we thought it was a, uh, such an interesting picture that no matter what it took to do that, I, I felt we had to do that one. So the tower came with a whole bunch of challenges. I mean, not only did we have to build this huge set piece, but you know, we, we had to make sure that it was safe for actors to get on, that it wasn't going to blow over. Um, when the photograph was taken, it wasn't taken at an angle that was like dead on. It was taken at this wonky angle. And so then in order to match up the film, we had to build the tower in kind of a wonky way. It was pretty much exactly as I thought it would go building it. Um, this was something we didn't want to build on site here because you can get, you know, kids climbing on it. So we actually took it to the local arena, uh, built it there because they had a fenced in area there and we had the actors come in and the actors were a little bit hesitant and I don't blame them but we had to assure them no you're not going to fall down we're going to build little platforms for you to sit on but we had to get everybody comfortable uh, and then we disassembled it uh, loaded it on 
trailer and took it out to the to the end site. But once we got it on set onto the middle of a windy hill, things changed then and uh, uh, we had to do a lot more bracing than we thought. Um, but in the end, it, it was solid and uh, and there were no deaths. It was a challenge to find the location for the tower film because there are not very many clear horizons uh, left, you know, the trees are in the way. And then uh, it wasn't until we found a farmer's field just outside of Waterford uh, that we were able to build the tower on there and position the camera so that you didn't see anything else in the background. The cast was the largest for that film and um, it was a bit more of a challenge. Um, we took headshots of everybody that auditioned and then it was a matter of matching their build, their look uh, to the people in the film. We even uh, had to eliminate a couple of the children out of the, the picture itself because we didn't have people that would match up to that. I was just really impressed because everyone came and they were serious and they were going to see this through. You know, a lot of times people think acting is very glamorous. It, it's a lot of hurry up and wait. It was a lot of waiting for me, but I liked it because I got to kind of take in what was going on and just kind of see it all come together. I got to meet new people and it was just, a it was really fun. I really liked it and I would definitely do something like this again. Everybody gets along, the little kids, they're playing with the other little kids there and no tension, no nothing there. It's just a nice day out, to be honest. Uh, as far as seeing the, uh, the script that I had written come to life, it was, it was something very interesting. I mean, you, have, you start with one picture and you make up your characters as, you know, as much as you can in, in three minutes. And uh, it's a very interesting thing to, to watch unfold. Now don't you boys climb another inch. We've got a train to catch to Brantford and I haven't scheduled any time for a hospital visit. Besides, this tower is not meant for climbing. Then why did they build it? And why did they put ladders on it? So we can spy on the Americans. No, not quite, Elizabeth. They built this geodetic tower so that the entire Dominion of Canada could be mapped and measured. What does geodetic mean? And how can one measure the entire Dominion of Canada? with this one tower. Don't bother everyone with your questions, Ruth. That's quite all right, Edith. I enjoy it when the young ones ask questions. Unfortunately, I've reached the limit of my knowledge on this subject. Perhaps Mr. Lewis would care to help out here. Well, but of course. There is not just this one tower, Ruth, but hundreds all across this great nation of ours. As far as I understand, it has to do with triangulation. Triangle races? <laughs> no. Not triangle races, though if there were such a thing, I reckon this tower would be the best place to view it. Triangulation. Triangulation. But how does it work? Well, if you know two angles and one length, or two lengths and one angle of a triangle, then you can use trigonometry to... mathematics... <laughs> to figure out the missing pieces without having to measure the whole thing. That makes everything complicated. Why not just use a measuring tape, like when you're woodworking? One would need a measuring tape that stretched 20 miles or more. Now that's right. Not practical. Now how it works is this. Men from the Geological Society climb to the top of the tower at night and use a very bright light to bounce a beam off a mirror on another tower, say in Woodstock or Long Point. Once the beams align, they know they have a straight line. Is it true that they chart the stars at night as well, like the mariners do? Why, yes. I've heard they do that too. They use the stars to find their latitude. How tall would you say this tower is? Uh, 70 feet. And on this hill, it is the highest point in Norfolk County. It looks like it goes on forever. I wish I could climb to the top of this tower. I mean, the view must be incredible. No daughter of mine will ever climb a tower in her Sunday best. Well, then we'll come back on Tuesday. All right, everyone, that's enough. Come along, we have a train to catch. Come along. Mm. 
After the two days of filming, um, we all took a collective sigh of relief and left it in the hands of Rainy Media to edit. And it was down to me and uh, Holly, my assistant editor, to put these things together. And so you, uh, we just started at it. And a couple of times we were called in to take a look at some of the footage as it was going along and it just built the excitement and we decided that we needed to launch it in a, the biggest way possible. So we decided that we were going to show it on the big screen and we rented the Strand Theatre in Simcoe and arranged to have a, a launch party after. The premiere was one of the proudest moments of my professional career. And we had a great turnout. Um, government officials were there, the mayor of the county, everyone from the cast and crew, a lot of curious people. And um, to see those films on the big screen was such a proud moment for me and I know uh, a prideful time for everyone that was involved. Uh, just to see the reaction of the crowd at the Strand Theatre the, the day of the debut was, was wonderful. My grandma keeps sending me all the brochures that come in the mail from the from the museum, she goes, oh yeah, there's pictures of Emily in this, and we have them up on the refrigerator right now, so, little mini scrapbook. A lot of my teachers walking up to me, apparently the vice principal of my school sent out the video to like every teacher in the school, and we've had people approaching us and saying, oh, good job on your YouTube video, and yeah, it's got actually really good response. The films are going to be used in the museum. They're all being incorporated into permanent exhibits. We've created an education program for grades seven and eights that uh, incorporate the films. And uh, they're on YouTube for the whole world to see and, sh and be shared that way. It's kind of flipped things around. Now, you know, Melissa and James are not at the museum waiting for people to come down to them. They're now getting the stories out there to them. My advice to anybody else wanting to do this is just do it. I mean, there are so many um, benefits from this and I can't think of any downfalls from it. It was just a fantastic experience from beginning to end and it's such a great way to share the stories that are in those still photographs, to bring those to life, to, to capture a real moment, an authentic moment in your history.